Good day, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. But first, before we get to the podcast, I'm glad that you're here with us live. Really glad, actually, whatever social platform you happen to be on at this point. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, and wherever you are, please say hello and tell us where you are physically. Uh, it'd be great for us to know that. I'll be introducing our guest in a second. And speaking of our guest, uh, when I have him join us, I just want you to imagine that you're joining us for a cup of coffee or whatever the right beverage is for the time of day that it happens to be for you. Uh, and so just as if you were joining us, then you can ask your questions, share your comments and your ideas. If you do that, we'll have a better conversation and eventually uh, and, and we'll all enjoy our time together more, and eventually we'll have a better podcast as well. So if you didn't know, this will eventually be a part of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. So to set that part all up, now that we're past just setting all of you up for being with us live, I will do a countdown where we'll actually start the official podcast episode, and that will be in three, two, one. Presence is often discussed as a must-have for leaders. And the higher you move organizationally, the more it seems to matter. So, so what is presence? And specifically, what is executive presence? That's the topic of our episode today. If you are serious about your growth and your career advancement and your overall ability to influence others, you are absolutely in the right place. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, where we are helping leaders grow prefers, excuse me, personally and professionally to lead more effectively and make a bigger difference for their teams, organizations, and the world. If you're listening to this podcast, you could have been with us live and could do that in on future episodes on your favorite social channel. You can get all that information about where you, where and when you can join us live um, and see these episodes sooner by joining our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn to do that. Today's episode is brought to you by our new book, The Long Distance Team, Designing a Team for Everyone's Success. You can learn more by going to longdistanceteambook.com. And with that, let me bring in our guest today. His name is Joel Garfinkel, and now you can see him. And now I'm going to introduce him. Joel is a recognized master executive coach holding the master certified coach designation, and Global Gurus lists him 14th on their list of global coaching experts. He's the author of 11 books, including his latest executive presence um, and his interviews and articles on executive presence, career advancement, and leadership issues can be, have appeared in HBR and the Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, USA Today, Forbes, CNN, the New York Times, NPR, and now the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Uh, Joel, welcome. Uh, sir. Thank you, Kevin. Great to be here with you. Looking forward to it. And we've got a little bit of a delay. We didn't, which we didn't have before we went live, but there's a slight delay, but I think we'll be okay. I am glad that you're here and I want to dive into this book. Um, but I, I want to start by asking the question of what sort of led you to this work? Sort of why this particular stuff? You know, it's interesting. About 20 years ago, I saw a certain pattern to the clients I was working with, uh, similar issues. And it was specifically, you know, women, minorities and introverts were being held back in their careers because they lacked executive presence. Uh, they came across as the theme I saw and the pattern I saw as they came across as tentative, quiet, um, too deferential. And I felt drawn to wanting to help these groups of people kind of own their power and presence and, and have more strength and lead with a stronger presence. And so that, that kind of started it all when I started to see that happen and realize that th there's, there's a certain process and a certain need here that I really wanted to fill. Uh, awesome. And the book helps us do that. And we're going to dive into that in a second. Um, you open the book with a quote from Walt Whitman that I absolutely love. Um, and, and he said that we convince by our presence and in the, in the tease in the open, I said, well, what is exactly presence? Uh, people ask me that all the time. So that's probably where we should start. Like, what do we even mean by presence? You know, presence is really about how you show up. And so when you show up in the work environment, are you coming across and radiating a certain degree of what I would say is confidence? 
and having confidence in, in most of your interactions, which means communicating with conviction and clarity, uh, avoiding ambiguity when you're communicating with conviction and clarity. And it means being even a bold and decisive decision maker, uh, coming across as professional and competent. So executive presence is really, you want to have a reputation for making things happen. Um, and, you know, people will look at you and see how are you showing up with at work? Are you showing up with a strong presence? And how are you speaking? And how are you making decisions? All of that's being evaluated. And you want to be able to show that you're not just radiating gravitas, but you're communicating with a sense of authority. And you're also expressing yourself more fully. And that's really, you know, key components of executive presence. So I, I asked what is presence and then you sort of quickly moved into executive presence, which of course is what we're talking about right. today. Uh, what's, what's, how would you define the difference? I mean, or what is the difference between presence and then having executive presence? So pr presence is basically how you show up. That's the bottom line is what I would say. It's, it's how you're showing up. And when you show up, how are people not just perceiving you, but how are they receiving you? And so that's how you're showing up. That's presence. Then executive presence, which sometimes people get hung up, hung up on the word executive. So you could replace it with the word leadership if that makes it more inviting and accessible to you. So you could call it leadership presence at times. But that so it's taking your presence and saying, OK, now with my presence, let's look at if I had to define what executive presence is. Am I telegraphing that I'm in charge, that I have confidence, that I come across as um, my words and actions kind of show that I know what I'm doing, I'm winning the confidence of those around me, and I'm showing that I, I can be in charge, and I'm a, I'm a compelling force in the organization. I'm not passive, I'm not meek, I'm not tentative, but I'm showing up with someone who has a power and presence that people can feel, can recognize, and your imprint uh, on the work environment is felt. So uh, obviously the book is titled executive presence, which is, which is fantastic. Uh, and you've now talked about, uh, leadership presence, executive presence, which I think is helpful because not everyone says, well, I don't want to be in the C-suite. And right. yet all of what we're talking about today applies, whether we're an aspiring leader, whether we're a frontline leader, or whether a leader of leaders doesn't have to be, uh, in the C-suite for these things to apply. Agreed? Absolutely. And I think it, I've worked with leaders who have been in the C-suite uh, in mid-level management and even starting off in their career. They'll tell me that, oh, these executive presence concepts are relevant for me and I've used them at different stages in my career. The thing I think you have to realize the shine as a leader with executive presence is you, you need to become someone who influences outcomes, trying to contribute to the decisions that are being made and drive some change. And so no matter where you are in the organization, you don't want to wait for that to happen. You want to look at what ways can I leverage my influence to positively shape outcomes? How can I lean more into situations, whether it's projects, meetings, um, um, interactions I'm having with other leaders? How do I show up with someone who has something to say and has some, some level of um, influence and impact that I'm trying to make, no matter what my title or position is. So the question people might be asking, <laughs> is, and and you you talk about it earlier in the book as well, which makes sense, and that is like, okay, that all sounds good, Joel. How do I know if I have it? Like, do I have any of it already? Uh, th there's a couple of questions here, but let's first just get at this sort of awareness of where we are now. How do we figure this out? You know, I, I think the key thing is one thing people have mentioned to me is, and then this gets to the model. I have a three by three model and I have nine different competencies and I lay this out really clearly in the book. And what people have found is that I can look at these nine competencies and, you know, we have gravitas and underneath the gravitas column, we have, are you coming across as confident, commanding and charismatic? And then under the authority column, which is the middle column, am I coming across as decisive, bold, and influential? And then the third column is expression. Am I expressing myself, which means the third, the three competencies are, am I being vocal? Am I speaking up? 
Am I then being insightful? So when I am speaking up, am I coming across as insightful? And the third competency is clarity. Am I coming across as clear? Now, those nine competencies, you could look at that model, that one sheet in the book, and it lays those nine out and say, which ones do I do well and which ones can I do better? You can immediately evaluate your own executive presence and immediately come to a conclusion which ones you need to improve upon and which ones uh, are you doing really well. And it's also something I've had people print out uh, when they've emailed me and I sent them a PDF of it. They are able to take that and then share it with their manager or other leaders and say, how do you perceive my executive presence? And that can be really powerful because then you get data from others that are giving you feedback on what you need to improve upon and what looks good and what doesn't versus someone saying, well, executive presence, I don't know exactly what it is. It's too nebulous to me. I can't really define it. Instead, now you have a really clear def definition of what it is, and that allows people to use it as a foundation to know what to change and what not to change. So you, you've hinted at an answer here, but I, I think one of the things that I hear uh, in, in working with leaders is some of the things you described, like charisma, and that's one of them that I want to come back and talk to about more. But some people will even say just about presence in general, like, OK, I don't know if I have it, but I also know that you that you either got it like this is genetic, like I either got this or I don't. Um, you've now said it's competencies. So that kind of tells us the answer to the question. But like, how do you respond to people when they say, well, that's awesome. I wish I had it, but uh, I don't got that stuff. I, I say that. I mean, I wrote the book for people who don't have it is really what I would say. And I, and I would say that, you know, some people have expressed to me, you know, some of these competencies seem like that if you're more of an extroverted person, you're going to have some of these qualities. And I think there's some truth to that. And if you're more of an introvert or you're someone who's um, maybe in the STEM fields, engineering, science, um, um, you know, technology, math, or you're a little more shy, um, or you're sometimes people who are minorities. I found these groups have drawn, been drawn to the model because they're like, these are some of the competencies, gravitas, authority, expression that I can see that I can actually do more of. And so it isn't something you're born with. It's something that I really feel that you, you can develop and you can improve. Some people have a leg up. Some people have a certain advantage automatically. Um, but I find people in the work environment, you know, I, when I do workshops and I, and I used to do a lot more before the pandemic, but when I did a lot of them, uh, what I found is I always took a, a, a poll in the beginning. I said, how many of you consider yourself introverts? And I would say 80% to 85% would raise their hand. I was shocked by that. And we're talking rooms of like 80 to 100 to 150 people. And I think what I found is that on some kind of line, you know, people have different degrees of introversion, but people could relate to having some part of introversion. And so then a lot of these competencies of how do I show up more confident and commanding and charismatic and decisive, bold, influential? How do I do this when my tendency of my personality is to hold back a bit, is to withdraw a bit? And the key thing is you want to lean into that more and show up more and have more of a presence and be a more stronger, bolder leader. Uh, ultimately, at some point in your career, you recognize that that becomes more of a necessity and you can't just rely on your competence and your performance to be good enough. Well, that raises all sorts of questions, which some of which <laughs> we'll get to in a minute. But but I want to go back to something a minute ago, because you talk about this in the book and I agree 100 percent. And I want to get into some of the competencies and some of those things. But one of the things like it, you, if Joel, you're telling me I need to be bold, I need to be commanding and, and some of those things. And yet you say, man, we ought to be asking for feedback. So let's talk about that, because I think sometimes people are concerned in a leadership role, especially as they move higher. Like I don't it, asking for feedback makes me look weak. Asking for feedback makes me uh, makes maybe doesn't send the message I want to send, which I don't agree with. But talk to talk to us about that, like the the value slash importance of asking for feedback, not only in terms of what we get, but how it's perceived when we do. You know, oftentimes people's fear, and I do hear this also, is that their fear is what are people going to say? And and sometimes I don't want to hear it. 
and I'm scared they're going to say something negative or something um, that I'm not I'm, I'm hesitant to, to want to hear. And the key thing I say is, well, the bottom line is they're already thinking it. You might as well know it. And so let's ask the question. And if you invite and you, you have the model in front of you, you invite and say, hey, I really want to grow. I know this is an area I need to improve on. Um, I really need your feedback and I want your support. That's very inviting. And now a person's, the person feels like, okay, I want to help you. And then the conversation becomes one, get, give me the feedback. Great. Then the second question becomes, well, what can I do to improve this? And what would you be willing to do to help me improve this? So then it becomes, and what suggestions do you have for me to get better at executive presence or the certain competencies I want to work on? So now all of a sudden, you're not just asking for the feedback, you're enlisting their support, and then you're going to go and take their suggestions, go apply it, go back to them maybe a month later and say, hey, here's the suggestions you provided to me. Here's what I did. Did you notice? You know, what, what do you think? Have you seen any improvement? Now, all of a sudden, it becomes a dialogue where maybe three or four or five people you're doing this with, all of a sudden, you get some advocates who are actually engaged in wanting to support your development and actually are participating in helping you get better at something. And they're giving you suggestions and you're applying it and getting better. That's a very yeah. hands on. And they're helping approach. you be accountable. Right. Because now, accountable. like once I ask for that and I say, hey, I'm going to that's a good idea. I'm going to do yeah. that different in meetings. And then I ask you, and then like I got to I got to take action now. It's harder yes. for me to to step back and say, well, that was nice, but or I'm scared or whatever. If I know that someone's watching and I know that <laughs> someone is trying to help me and I've engaged them in that way, I think it's super important. And, and Kevin, the other thing I was just thinking of is that's important here is. I often tell my leaders, I say, has anyone ever come to you and asked you for feedback? And they always say yes. And I say, what's that feel like? And they're like, I like it. I like when people ask me and want my advice or want And my do feedback. I feel, do I feel, be how do I, how does that change my feeling about them? Right. And it's almost always positive. Always positive. And so then I say, well, you just felt what it felt like when it came to you. Now you're going to do the same with someone else. They're going to feel the same way you feel. So that, that kind of takes away the fear and they go, oh, I never thought of it that way. Yeah, that's a really, that's really effective, which just shows, Joel, that you're a good coach. Uh, so yeah. there's a bunch of these words that you yes. keep saying that are a part of these. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to put these back on the screen because you've said them. The three big ideas here are, and, and so let's just talk about these briefly. I want to get into some of the specific competencies in a second. So you got the three big areas, we'll call them. Uh, of executive presence. The first is radiate gravitas. Real quick, what does that mean at a high level? Gravitas is really about you're coming across as a confident leader and you're in command, meaning you know how to take charge of situations and you have a certain degree of charisma. Okay. That's gravitas. And the second the second area is is act with authority. And what do you mean here? means you're someone who comes across with certain behaviors that people see you as being decisive. You know, you, you act with conviction, you're bold and you put a stake in the ground and really own your position and you're influential. You're convincing, compelling, able to persuade people towards a certain point of view. That's authority. And the third one is more of the communication, well, all of it's communication related, but you say express yourself fully um, a little bit more on this one before. We so go expression means you're vocal, you're you share your thoughts and ideas without hesitation. So you speak up at meetings and when you do speak up, your second one is insightful. So expression is about being insightful, making good recommendations, um, asking excellent questions. And the third part is really about clarity. So the key thing about your expression, are you coming across as succinct to the point, clear and crisp? So uh, as I was preparing for this conversation, Joel, I was, I, was, I was trying to do something that I'm not very typically very good at, which is being cynical. Uh, and, and so I was thinking, okay, some of these things, they're, there's very little uh, there's very little controversy about people being having being clear. There's very little controversy about people wanting to, about people being influential. Right. Um, and yet some of the others, maybe there's a little bit more tension and maybe there's some things that we ought to think about here. Like, is it possible for us to be too commanding 
or too decisive. I'll just take those two first off of the gravitas line, or, or excuse me, off of one off of the gravitas line and one off of the uh, the authority line. Like, can we be too decisive? Can we be too commanding? What are your thoughts about those? And those take them separately if you wish. Yeah, you know, I, the, the commanding one I'll start with, and you know, there's a sweet spot of executive presence that lies between being too nice and too aggressive or too commanding. And so the commanding piece, you know, people don't have, who don't have executive presence often come across as can be as being too nice, but unassertive. But people possess a high level of certain qualities like commanding and they they over pivot with it, uh, can come, ac come across as arrogant or aggressive. So you, you know, what we really want is find a sweet spot where we're not being so commanding that it's it's you're dictating and you're being um, a dictator almost. You know, you want to have the command, the strength and the confidence behind your ideas, but you don't want to force it so much so that it's too aggressive. It's too much on one side. Uh, with the decisive one, the key thing is, a lot of times people want to be perfect with their decisions. So they don't, they, they tend to be too indecisive and don't make a decision quickly enough. Now getting, being too decisive can be, you're less collaborative. You're not working with people right. as effectively. And so it's important to sometimes, you know, want to be collaborative and bring people into your decision-making process, but you don't always have to be so decisive that you're ignoring other people's opinions. Finding that balance between balance. those things. Yeah. So um, the next one I want to talk about briefly is uh, it's kind of like that word presence, although it's even at a higher level with me. Like uh, often I will hear people say, you know, well, man, charisma, like that's a good thing. Like being charismatic, like maybe there's a downside to that too much of that, but having <laughs> charisma, man, I wish I had it but I didn't like that didn't come in my DNA. Like I'm going to go back to what we sort of said about, about presence. So my question about being charismatic or about having charisma is, is that really a skill and what's, what's a skill in that package that will help people get past that? Well, I just didn't get that. I just don't have that one. I, I thought you might go there because of all my competencies, the one that people could, feel alienated by the most is the charismatic one. And I'll, I'll take a leader I'm working with right now. He is working in a biotech industry. He's a scientist and he is a, a leader with a lot of influence in the company. He's incredibly soft-spoken, one of the most soft-spoken voice-wise and his personality. They go hand in hand. He's soft-spoken. He's withdrawn. He doesn't speak up very much. He doesn't take much command. He lacks charisma. Now, the thing that we've been working on, and if you break down charismatic into its subcomponents, you could see like, oh, so for example, with this leader, I've worked on, could he be more enthusiastic? Could he be have a more optimistic attitude? Um, could he motivate and inspire others more intentionally? Um, could he be more approachable with people? But the key thing with him is, could he raise his voice? Could he project more? Could he have more enthusiasm behind his ideas? Because his tendency is, I have enthusiasm, but I don't express it. So then it's like, how do you get more motivated and more behind your idea and get more enthusiastic behind it and bring more energy behind it? Right. That's what we're talking about. So even someone who's so extremely had, lacks zero charismaticness, um, could still elevate it to some degree. And, and that's, so I think with charismatic, it don't either easily discount it just because, oh, I'm not that other person over there who naturally has charisma and is, is and I'm not that. Still recognize that can I as a leader and people who are listening to this, can they sit there and hear themselves and say, could I have more enthusiasm and energy in my voice? Could I get behind some ideas that I'm excited by and let that excitement out? Am I feeling motivated or passionate about something that I'm bringing forward to the team? Um, is there am anything I sharing in my that with others? Am I sharing that excitement? That energy am I right? sharing that excitement with others? Because if you did that, charisma is a part of that. Exactly. 
you're no, it's I, I, it's inevitable for it not to show up unless it, everything someone does in their work they have some excitement or enthusiasm for and it's translating that enthusiasm and excitement in a vocal way so that people can feel it and that's the transmission of charisma so let's talk about tr transmission of all of this stuff right having presence even that word sort of implies in physical proximity like we mm. our presence is when we are present with someone else and now like a lot of people are leading uh, working uh, at a distance so what's your advice or counsel around all of this when we might be doing it at a distance uh, we might not be in the same physical location as our team or as our leaders or whatever regularly or even ever yeah, the, the key thing is it's easy on, let's say, Zoom or in a hybrid working environment and you're not necessarily physically present. It can be even more important to sh make sure, how's my voice? How's my body language? How's my tone? Am I coming across with some conviction and confidence? How do I punctuate my points? Do I talk in an engaging voice? Am I telling engaging stories? You know, those all matter. And at the same time, you're looking at, am I speaking up enough in these virtual environments so that my voice, my message, my connection with others is there? So it, you want to like, I, one thing I recommend people doing is put some questions and talking points, prepare for every Zoom call or virtual meeting they're on and prepare a couple talking points so that when it comes time for those points to be expressed, they're at the top of your mind and you're ready to deliver it. And then you can actually show up and, and share. Every meeting you attend, you should be speaking up at least twice, every single meeting, so that your presence is felt. And then when you do speak, know what you're talking about, make sure you're really having strong eye contact, your good facial expressions, and you're really presenting yourself with some authority and confidence so that people can really feel your presence. You know, one of the things that I've found uh, in, in doing so much virtually for such a long time, and I've been leading a remote team for well over a decade, uh, but like you doing all sorts of things like you and I are doing right now, right? So one of the things that you can do is that many times things you're doing virtually, not all, of course, but some of the things you're doing virtually are recorded, right? You have a meeting, it's recorded because not everyone's there. Uh, I mean, I could, anytime I want, look at this recording as an example or of a, a meeting, our team meeting last Friday, and I could watch it again and just watch me to see like even my own perception of mm -hmm. how am I coming across? Like there's yeah. a difference between me sitting like this and me yes. sitting like this. And there's a, and, and I can see those things on camera where you would never see those for yourself. Uh, That's a great a, point. In a face-to-face -face setting, right? You have the chance. And, and, and you can even, although there's a lot of people that say, well, people are getting zoom fatigue because they're watching themselves. But even in this moment, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the camera or I'm looking in your eyes uh, and yet I can look over to say, well, Kate, does it look like you're sort of paying attention here, Kevin? Does it look like you're showing any energy or not? <laughs> and and that shouldn't be what we're doing all of the time, sort of self-monitoring. And yet we've got to, we've got a set of cues here that we would never have in a face-to-face -face yes. setting that we have on a camera. It's true. You that's an excellent point. And it's a good observation that it's one thing to observe yourself during the Zoom call in the moment of looking, hey, how am I coming across right now in this moment? But it's also taking a time in the later and looking at the recording. I think it's a great idea and say, how did I come across on the points I did express? It's an opportunity to evaluate yourself that we normally don't have. Right. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't ask for feedback from others because it isn't just our perception. As you said at the beginning, yeah. this is about how others perceive us and receive our information and, uh, and and that sort of thing. So it shouldn't be only that, but it seems like that could be a useful thing. So. Yeah. Before we sort of shift gears and start to move into the final phase here, uh, Joel, anything I didn't ask that you wished I had? Um, no, I, I think you asked a lot of great things. I, I think the key thing is I really want people to show up with all their power and presence because I find too often the leaders I'm coaching come to me and what I notice is that they feel like they're being either held back because of their culture, because of the work environment, because of their personality, 
uh, because of where they're from and who they are. And it's in part of me is like, I want the company to maximize the talent of their employees. And I want the employees to feel fully engaged and feel like they're getting the most out of their work environments. And I feel like the executive presence can be a key component of saying, how do I step into my own power, convey confidence and really lead with conviction? And here's an opportunity of how to do that. So that that's one thing I really do care about and want people to have that opportunity. We're talking with Joel, Joel Garfinkel, talking about his new book, Executive Presence. Here it is. If you're watching, you can see it. Uh, and if you're not, we'll get you more information about that in a second. But before we do that, Joel, what do you do for fun? I like to work out. I like to spend time with my family. I like uh, walking my dog outdoors and being outdoors and connecting with nature. Um, those are some of the things I enjoy a lot. And I'm pretty confident, like me, that you also read. So my question is, what is it that you're reading these days? Or what's something that you've read recently that people might want to know more about? I read a book uh, that always has stayed with me. And it comes to mind as you ask the question. And that is a book by um, Thich Nhat Hanh, a Vietnamese monk. And it's called Peace is Every Step. And it's really about mindfulness and being present. And I find that it had a lot. It's a very tangible book with a lot of practical ways to be more mindful and more self-aware and more present in your day-to-day -day life. Peace is every step. And uh, so we'll have that in the show notes as well as a link to this book, Executive Presence by Joel Garfinkel. So the question is, where can we learn more? get the book, that sort of thing. Like, where do you want to point people? Where can we learn more about all the good stuff that you're doing these days? So the executive presence book, you can get it on Amazon. Um, it, it's, it was voted best leadership book in 2022, number one Amazon bestseller. So you can get it on Amazon. Um, you want to reach out to me directly. My website is garfinkelexecutivecoaching.com. And you can email me from the website. And any questions you have, you're reading the book and you have some questions or thoughts, um, I always respond back to all emails and would love to talk to you. I also have over 300 articles and about 25 specific articles on executive presence on my website. So there's a lot of content and information that's that's valuable for people to get access of and, and help them in their careers. Garfinkel, executivecoaching.com. If you're watching, you see it on the screen. But if not, we'll say it again so you can get it written down. Garfield, Garfinkel, executivecoaching.com. There you go. Um, Thank you so much for being with us, Joel. But before we finish, I've got a question I, I'm going to ask everybody else. It's the question I ask you all every single week, every single episode. And the question is now what? What are you going to do with this? What mm -hmm. insight did you get today that you're going to go take action on yet today or tomorrow, depending on when you happen to be watching or listening? You know, did you get something about the balance of commanding that's useful for you? Did you learn something about how you can be more vocal or the choice to do that. Did you get an insight about how we can move beyond our existing tendencies into leaning into having more presence? Did you, what did you take from this that you can um, help that will help you uh, be a more effective leader, a more influential leader, uh, a leader with greater presence. And so Joel, thanks again for being here. Such a pleasure to have you. Um, I've been looking forward to this conversation. I'm glad we finally got it to happen. Thank you, Kevin. And so everybody, thank you for being here. It's been a pleasure to have you, whether you've been with us live or you're listening to it on the podcast later. Know that we're here every week with another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. So make sure you come back, make sure you subscribe and like us and you know how to do all those things. Share this with a friend and we'll see you next week on another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Thanks, everybody.